I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Tashika. Uh, she is an educator, graphic designer, image maker, and writer. She's an associate professor of graphic design and creative technologies and a faculty in the MFA program in graphic design at Vermont College of Fine Arts. She is also the principal and founder of Black Voice Design, which is a studio specializing in branding, electronic media, identity, illustration, and publication design. Tashika is truly recognized for researching Black people omitted from the graphic design history canon. She is specifically interested in the visual representation of Black people in the media um, and popular culture, primarily through the lens of stereotypes. And among multiple exciting publications, Tashika is the co-author of the forthcoming book, Black Design in America. It's a huge honor to welcome you as part of this series, and I really can't wait to learn from you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dana, for that uh, introduction. And I'll go ahead on and um, share my screen. Oops, sorry. Share my screen and get started. So when I um, first was thinking about um, this particular presentation, it really was trying to think about my work and my practice as a whole um, and try to think about like what's at the core of the work that I do. So what I realized that a lot of the work that I do um, is elevating marginalized voices and telling the untold stories. And I do this through my teaching, my creative activities, and through my research and writing. So hopefully through this presentation, it is clear how my teaching, creative practice, writing and research um, shows how I unlearn, how I explore, how I do, how I transform, and how I reprogram to rethink design. So, um, with my teaching, the the one of the main things that I that I try to do is to help my students find their own unique voice um, as young designers, right? Uh, the way that I try to do that is to give projects and assignments that um, that help them um, investigate their identity, their community um, through the lens of history, usually. Um, and what I find that does is um, it helps them feel a little bit more confident about themselves and then their voices when they have to sort of kind of reflect, you know, on their own identity and community. So this project here is called Postcards, Design Histories from Our Hometowns. Um, I taught this project last year uh, at NC State. And I have my students do research about design history in the, the towns and places and spaces that they're from. And so um, I did give them some kind of structure and places to start because if I would have just told them, hey, do some research on design in your hometown, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have had a clue, right? And you know, not all students even know where to start or how to conduct research. So I gave them kind of four areas to start with. So one was um, publications. So to look at, you know, you know, obviously the publications that they had like easy access to, but also to dig a little deeper and try to find ones that were like more kind of like subculture or, you know, zines or more specific to a particular, you know, maybe group of people or things like that. Um, I also had, you know, tasked them with researching um, education. You know, so looking at, you know, institutions, you know, whether two-year colleges, private or public universities, looking at the faculty and the people who teach there and seeing what type, of, what type of courses they teach, look at the history of people who taught at those institutions. Um, and the other two hours was for them to research design studios, um, as well as printing companies, right? Like places that actually do, um, various forms of printing. And so um, the other thing that they were tasked with doing was they you know, had to sort of conduct some research, right? To help fill in the gap, to help create um, you know, these narratives and these storylines. And um, each student um, were given um, three spreads. You know, we decided that we were gonna produce um, a publication. So they each had three spreads and those pages had to include you know, their writing, um, you know, sort of summary or synopsis of the information that they found, 
using um, various forms of information design, like timelines, but it didn't have to be done in a traditional um, data visualization way. They were able to sort of come up with their own kind of um, structures in order to relay that content and that information. Um, and I think this, this project was, was really good for them because most of them didn't know anything about design um, from the places that they, um, that they were from. So oftentimes um, I enjoy giving poster projects. Uh, most of the times those projects are, poster projects are really for fun and they're really about exploring form and composition. But sometimes um, I do task them with sort of exploring um, things that are in the media that are sort of happening right now that are near and dear to their hearts. So these two students both um, designed posters about things that were sort of happening in their own communities. Um, so racism um, is a poster that was designed from an Asian American student. Um, and the, the top portion of the poster reads, in 2020, we saw a spike of racism within the Asian American and Pacific Islander community here in the United States, along with COVID-19. The reported anti-Asian hate crime has increased by 339% in 2021, compared to the year before nationwide. And um, the other poster had to do with um, uh, Uyghur uh, Muslims um, being eradicated. So it says the Chinese Communist Party's campaign to eradicate ethnic minorities had led to the forceful detention of overseeing 2 million Uyghur Muslims. So besides, you know, doing the you know, obviously doing the research um, as well as um, designing the posters. Part of some of the process of producing um, these projects is I encourage the students to like get off the computer and try to create imagery and topography and things that have like, you know, sort of more of a hand or analog on human qualities to give a more emotional, to have more of an emotional impact on the viewer. Um, some take heed to that and some, you know, some don't, which we all know as educators, um, we only have but so much, you know, kind of control of what to produce, which in the classroom I actually try not to be that hands-on or, or, or be that, or, or try not to be an art director in that way. I really like to have them kind of be free with how they want to um, sort of express themselves. And then this next project, um, I tax students with uh, basically doing some research on designers, but they had to be designers that were BIPOC and are part of the LGBTQ plus um, communities. And the student um, was really sort of moved by the work of uh, Ruth Carter, who is a, a black uh, costume designer. And she does like a lot of costume design for a, a lot of major um, uh, black film. And so um, part of the process of producing um, this publication, the students had to um, create some layouts and stuff completely analog, like literally like cut and paste and, and tear things up and, and things like that. And so I feel like without having them do that process that when they you know, move um, their designs and their, their compositions to the computer, you know, I don't think that this student would have came up with you know, really kind of diving deep, not only to understand the root cutter's work in our process, but being able to express that through the layout and through the design. So doing the, you know, the analog and being messy and not worrying about, you know, we talked about grids, they know all about the Swiss grids and things like that, but that's not what we were concerned about. And I told them to come up with a structure, to come up with grids, to come up with a way of treating the layout and the topography that spoke to the work itself and not worrying about, you know, um, traditional um, sort of design uh, in that way. Um, <clears throat> over the years, I've had the opportunity to teach uh, graphic design history. And the first few years that I taught it, it was at Southeastern, well, actually it's the only place that I taught it, was at Southeastern Louisiana University. And at the time, my, my mentor and colleague, um, basically was over teaching uh, history for, I don't know, however many years he was there. And um, the problem that I faced when I took over the class was that for one, Mags was the book that was um, basically 
that we had to use because it was the book that was already acquired by that class. And you, you know, if you adopt the book, you have to kind of use it for like three years or something crazy. So um, that was the first thing that I had to get past. Um, and the first year I taught it, it was kind of a disaster in a way where like the first semester, um, because when, 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 my, when my colleague taught it, he literally taught the whole mags book in one semester. And you know how mags is, is divided into these sections. And so like each section, he would actually give tests to the students. And that's crazy. Like I, I there was no way I was going to teach that class that way. Um, so I was, what I struggled with was like, so how do I try to find a balance with students who have had zero design history? So how do I sort of talk to them about like, okay, here's the canon, here's the people, and then talk about like all the other stuff that they can't find in, in these books, right? So um, initially I tried to like split the class up in half. It's like the first half, we do more traditional design history. In the second half, we talk about people of color and design, queer people in design history, other people who lives in other parts of you know world, especially like more in the Eastern you know parts of the world. Um, and so one, you know, one semester I taught um, and I explained to my students, I was really honest and open to them about like my research agenda and what, what I, you know, what I do in my spare time. And so, you know, I told them that like, um, I basically researched black people in design history who have been left out the design history books. And so um, we came up with this idea to create a scene that was about black design history. And so um, this project was really a true collaboration with my students. They did research on black designers, black publications and black design agencies. And so each student was tasked with being responsible with a spread. And then I sort of wrote and designed um, other parts of design to sort of help fill in some of the gaps. But they, um, it was all of their own writing. Um, it was their design, their layout. Um, each person had to include a, a photo of the designer and some, um, some images from their work. There was no grid. I left them sort of free to treat the layout the way, you know, the way they wanted to, the way they saw fit for the person's work. And the only thing that I, I say that they, you know, the other sort of rule, I guess, but they had to use the super family typeface freight that was designed by black type designer, Joshua Darden. And if you know, if you're familiar with that, with that type family, you know, it's huge, you know, so they had a lot of different, you know, um, fonts to sort of choose from, um, for their layout. And because, um, you know, the budget was small, I wrote a small grant to get this printed. We had to use a Rizzle graph, but it was nice to like, to include the students in the full process. Like they picked the colors, you know, for, for the printing. And we talked about the paper and we came up, you know, we voted on the title for the publication and things like that. Um, and, you know, they were really excited to, you know, to actually get something, you know, sort of um, concrete in their hands. And the thing that I tried to tell them was that this information that we have compiled in this publication doesn't exist like this anywhere, really. Not in a not in a printed in a printed form or since, and then especially not at the time. Um, last semester at UT, um, we had students get into the groups and to work on group projects, and um, you know they had various ideas, and some groups, you know, had a hard time with coming up with ideas and figuring out how do they sort of combine their voices and their ideas, and so this one group. The one thing that they could decide on in the beginning was that they wanted to design some kind of publication, but that was kind of it. You know, when it came to like, what would the publication be about? What did they want to say? They all have various interests. And I sort of talked to them and sort of helped guide them to kind of see how some of the things that they were interested in sort of overlap. And there was a way that they could kind of bring their voices together and be heard. So the title of the publication it came up with was missing, what's missing at the University of Texas in Austin. So what they decided was missing was racial inequality, gender inequality, queer uh, inclusivity, accessibility, um, affordability. Um, and so they, uh, they talked to um, students on campus to try to get an understanding of what they thought, you know, was sort of missing at UT. So I want to read for the introduction some of the questions that they asked their peers when they interacted with them. Do you identify with underrepresented groups 
of people at UT? Have you or someone you know experienced discrimination at UT? Have you seen any UT staff members in your program that identify similarly to you? Do you feel like UT is an, is an inclusive place? Do you think UT does enough for our marginalized groups? And so they sort of use the answer to these questions to sort of formulate some of the topics and, and the people that they interviewed, depending on um, what their focus was on. And um, <clears throat> back in uh, 20, oh, I can't believe it's been two years now, but 2021, um, January 2021, um, Bob Pop Design History um, was launched, and me, Pierre Bowens, and Salas Moreau designed a curriculum for a course called Black Design in America, African Americans and the Af African Diaspora and Graphic Design, 19th Century through the 21st Century. And so I just want to talk a little briefly about how this class even came about and how this format um, was the way that we thought would work best for this time. So back in 2020, when um, George Floyd um, was murdered, um, well, actually, no, it was before that. So even before that happened, Pierre Salas and I got together and we created a Google Doc and we started sharing our research. And we all had different sort of areas of Black design history that we were sort of focused on at the time. It was Black women in design. Pierre was sort of focused on the lack of diversity in design history publications. And for Solace, it was about Black queer design history. And so um, we created that Google Doc and was trying to move forward with creating like an outline or a typical contents because the, the idea, the thought was that we wanted to write a book together. And so after you know the process happened and George Floyd was murdered, we felt that like getting this information out was like really important and, and it felt urgent. We felt like we didn't have time to sort of shop around our ideas to go to you know um, to a publishing company, have somebody interested in writing, you know, all of that. So Solace um, uh, Studio Polymo came up with the way in which we could, you know, on the technical side, try to produce an online coach because we felt like, okay, it's it's a pandemic, we can't get together. So let's try to create this online platform. And so that's how Black Design in America um, was first started. And then we, you know, we took the chapters that we are uh, the structure that we had in our Google Doc, and we sort of made that be sort of like the courses for our, the online class. And one of the things that was sort of important with this course was to make it equitable and accessible to everyone. So we came up with like, you know, um, Polymo came up with this sort of sliding scale on, you know, so BIPOC students would pay like five bucks, you know, to purchase the course. Now, mind you, nobody was checking to see if somebody was actually a person of color or not. We just sort of let people decide, you know, and sort of be honest accordingly. But the main thing was to have the, the course um, accessible to, to mostly everyone who could. So in my um, creative practice, um, I, you know, do my best to provide a space or a platform for, you know, people of color, um, and at times, you know, it's been, you know, creative people of color like um, Julie Edwards, who is a, who is an artist, who is a painter, and she uses abstract paintings to explore how color, repetition, movement, and balance can serve as conduits to spiritual contemplation and interpersonal connections to her African American roots. And these type of projects, um, you know, this exhibition full spectrum was. Um, sort of like a retrospect, it was kind of like the first time that June Edmonds had, you know, a collection or a body of her work throughout, you know, over the years, right? So not just like her most recent work, you know, this exhibition showed like the work that she had, like when she first got started. Um, and so these kind of projects are the ones that like I would like to, to do more of, right? To be a part of, you know, providing a platform for our Black creatives. Um, back when I was living in New Orleans, which is that long ago, it feels like it's been a long time, but it's only been two years, but I did a lot of pro bono work for this nonprofit organization. Um, they're now called 826 New Orleans, um, but they're formerly known as um, Big Class New Orleans. 
And A26, what they do is they cultivate and support the voices of young writers ages 6 through 18 through creative collaborations with schools and communities. So what I would add to that is that I feel like it's really more like public schools, to be honest, in areas that are have that are, are schools that lack resources, right? They don't have, you know, teachers necessarily to put in hours to do after school writing programs like this for students who are interested um, in writing. So here's just like some of the values um, that big class um, and A26 sort of possess. They believe that confidence in the written language is fundamental to self-empowerment and future success. They believe in providing young writers with space, time, support, and opportunities to publish their work. And they also believe that writing is a great equalizer and can be a catalyst for social change. So I just wanna pull up a little um, video that they created that sort of, well, basically so you can hear from the students about their experience in this, um, in this program. It's just like so much stuff you can write about. I like to write about funny stories, the future stories. Entertainment culture is my bread, bread and butter. Wait, what, what's your character's name? Superboy. Oh, nice one, nice one. Big class is everything that I like. Big class is a creative writing program. They do different creative writing projects. There is a team of volunteers who come every week that create this kind of like after school clubhouse kind of atmosphere. We write books and then publish them. You're in a bookstore. I like publishing books because you can express all your feelings on the paper and then it becomes a book. Working with volunteers during big class is my favorite because they ask me questions to help build on to the story and the character's traits. The volunteers actually care for the students. Everyone that works for a big class is really passionate and it makes me feel passionate and want to do more. Whenever something comes from the child's brain, like magic happens. They let you choose your own topic and you could just get anything. Well, I wrote a book about candy escaping like a house. Like as a student, you have control. That's sort of empowering. It's about expressing your thoughts and just writing. You come here, big class. Oh, I had a rough day, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, here, just write about it. Whatever they're feeling, they can get it off their chest and put it in writing, or yeah. they can create something really beautiful. The stress you have at school, you could bring it here, and you could turn that stress into like a whole different mode of and write a, a wonderful story, or a poem, or a haiku, or anything. I think it's super important that I have big class because my school does unfortunately have a severe shortage of extracurricular activities. Writing was just like a secondary thing. Great. So one of the things that I enjoyed doing volunteering as a as a designer was that for the first time I had clients that were students that were kids. And it was really great to like walk into a classroom and meet with, you know, an editorial board of students. And they were filled with like these really great ideas on how they wanted their writing to be represented um, in these publications. So that was just um, a really great experience for me. And so I always try my best to sort of, you know, kind of bring to light, um, you know, their words basically through the design. Um, this project that was called The History Between the Foes is a collection of essays written by 11 and 12 graders at George Washington and Carver High School. The narrative takes many forms to, chrono to um, chronicle family, neighborhoods, identity, in New Orleans and configure how they thought about themselves in relationship to broader sweeps of history. Um, I'm gonna read a quote from the editorial board from this project. And they said, through this journey, we learned we all have different voices, but we come together for one goal, to let people hear our stories and to tell the world about us. Um, this other project, There Is No School Without Us was also um, a really fun and great project where um, that was writings and conversations that happened not only from the students' perspective, but from the teachers' perspective and from an, an administrator's perspective about the current state of public schools in New Orleans. And so um, 
I don't know. It was just really good because for the first time, and you know, you don't ever really get to hear what students think about their education. How do they feel about the rules and the regulations and even just basically like how they are being taught, how they're being taught to and what they're being taught in school. And so this book is unique in that, you know, they're very transparent. And then you get the perspective of, of the faculty, of the, of, of, of the teachers and what it means to teach in certain environments, what it means to try to teach these kids, you know, and they don't have, you know, all the resources and things like that, that they need, or they feel like they need to do their jobs. Um, so again, you know, meeting with the editorial boards and, you know, one thing I noticed with these two projects were they were very different, where the first group of students, a lot of the, the, the words that they were used, you know, for this project was like, we wanted to be professional and sophisticated and, you know, like those kind of words. And for this, you know, the students were like, oh, we wanted to represent us and be playful and represent like school um, fun and, 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 and more childlike. So I, you know, try to channel that. And, and sometimes I often have them like um, a lot of the illustrations is a combination of like, you know, like my, my drawings as well as theirs and things like that. Um, so it felt more um, like a, a, a true um, collaboration. And so for me, um, well, I'll talk about it after, after this project. So another iteration of a project that Big Class sponsored was this collaboration but I think it actually came more from Tulane University that reached out to big class into um, a high school called Sci High, which is a, a math and science high school in New Orleans. And so um, Professor Luke um, at Tulane University, who taught journalism, wanted these Tulane, Tulane students to sort of um, act as mentors and collaborate with writing projects uh, with the high school students and some of their topics. Um, throughout um, this series, because I, I worked on like, uh, I think it was like five editions um, we did um, over a few semesters. So like every semester to a different class of Tulane students who work with the high school students to produce um, crew. And their topics range from accent to mosquitoes, to Vietnamese food, to the importance of the Saints football team to um, the New Orleans community. Um, and I would say besides, um, sorry, I'm going too far. Besides, you know, working with the students to come up with ideas for the design, um, you know, these projects have a lot of creative freedom, obviously, because, you know, it's, I'm not getting paid. I mean, if I did get paid money, sometimes it was in the form of like a gift card or, you know, a very, very small stipend, but it really wasn't about, you know, the money. Um, I had creative freedom, which was fun, which was great because I was able to use like my own photography and graphics and illustration and things that sometimes I made things that was custom for the publications, but sometimes it was stuff that would just be sitting on my computer, you know, that I was able to kind of use and work within um, the themes that the, the students saw as their vision um, for their publication. So, um, Back in, uh, I want to say 2019, um, a professor, Michael Worthington at CalArts, which is where I um, went to graduate school, he started this um, archive of posters at CalArts. So um, it was an online archive where they created um, an online space that housed all these posters that was a part of CalArts um, lecture series. And then there was like a physical archive that you can go to and look um, at this poster collection. And so the idea was that in 2020, CalArts would um, put on an exhibition that was called, um, oh crap, what was the exhibition called? I forgot, I'm sorry. I'm having a, <laughs> uh, a brain for it. Uh, let's see, it was called um, Inside Out and Upside Down, posted from CalArts from 1970 to 2020. 2019, sorry. So the exhibition was supposed to open during the pandemic. That didn't happen because of the pandemic. And so um, after George Floyd, you know, was murdered in uh, in May of 2020 and uh, Michael Wardington, who was the curator of the exhibition and also the editor for the accompanying catalog that went with the exhibition, they had more time to rethink this space. And so Michael came up with this idea of he 
wanted the exhibition to have um, a sort of black voice or black experience to, 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 to be incorporated into the space. So he reached out to me and Silas, two black alums from the graduate program. Trust me, there aren't many black alums from CalArts, unfortunately. Um, so he reached out to us to sort of kind of spearhead this project. Um, and at the time, the, the exhibition space, how it was designed, was already set in stone. So the challenge that Solace and I had was like, how do we sort of keep the, the, the majority of the exhibition together, but just insert, our, insert ourselves into this, into this space? So we decided to do it through words, through our words. And we wrote more essays. So my essay was titled, when, uh, Where Are the Black Graphic Designers at CalArts? And that essay was about my own personal experience of what it felt like to be the only Black student in the design program for a whole year. My first year there, I was the only Black student in the undergrad and graduate programs. And, um, and then later, you know, Silas came along and a couple of other Black students. And so I just really sort of talked about that experience. And that experience included, you know, um, one of my first um, critiques where a group of students designed um, a car that had the Confederate flag on it. But they said the Confederate flag had nothing to do with the project. And it's like, wait, you can't just ignore something, even if this car is supposed to symbolize the Dukes of Hazzard. And if anybody ever watched the Dukes of Hazzard, it is not dripped with racism, right? I mean, it is. Um, so anyway, that was like my experience to Cal Arts. Like first critique day was that. So I talked about that in detail and I called those students out, not by name. Um, and I just sort of talked about how to me, it was like really eye-opening that nobody in that group, me being the only black person in the program to ask me how the hell I would feel about seeing the Confederate flag on a project. I, you know, like nobody thought to talk to me about it. To ask me, how this would affect me and what my feelings and thoughts was about it. And that didn't come out until I spoke out about it in the critique. So that was very disappointing to me. So the essay sort of talked about that. And so Dallas essay sort of was, was sort of this weaving back and forth between like the personal and the more global sort of issues that he has, like what it means to be a black man, to be queer, to be in design school, you know, to have all these sort of identities and experiences, to be biracial, you know, all these things. And so we decided to just sort of literally have our words interweave. And it was kind of like our essays was like talking to each other um, in the actual space. And the one thing that we, you know, that became really obvious for us with this project was that, you know, doing the research and looking at the posters, it was like, wow, Carlites, not only is the student in the student body lacking diversity, the people that you all have invited to campus to give these lectures lack diversity. So if we were hard pressed to find, you know, people of color who actually had given talks and lectures there at the school. And so we wanted to continue these conversations and have the program. And so we came up with a series of panel discussions to address some of these issues. And the one thing that Silas and I were really conscious of was like, we didn't want to be the only two people talking about these issues. We wanted to bring other people in to the conversation. It didn't matter if they were Black, if they were white, if they were, you know, women, you know, people of color, you know, we wanted to bring like a diversity of voices into the space. So one of the first, um, um, sort of panel discussions that had was an interview with Silas and I um, about our actual process um, with the exhibition. So I'm just gonna try to see if I can play a little clip. So what is ClickUp? Oh, ClickUp is an all-in-one productivity software where you can manage everything in any- Queued up. So. I guess I paused it. Silas and uh, Tashika, uh, what, what was your thought process when conceiving your response to the exhibition? Um, and Tashika, you want to start? Um, for me, um, I felt like the, the way that I had to start, the way that was um, 
I would honestly say easiest for me to start of getting into it was to just kind of reflect on my time at CalArts. And so um, that became obviously in my essay, very personal um, experience for me. Um, I think uh, thinking about the work that I did there, because most of the pro a lot of the projects that I did had to do with um, black culture and identity, um, had to do with uh, a lot of research that I did trying to discover influential uh, black graphic designers. And so all that um, just sort of kind of made sense for me to kind of address my actual experience of being a black student in a the program there. You describe the experience of being the only black student uh, during your first year of the MFA. Um, and, and how during the second and third year, there were some other black students that were accepted into the program. And, and you said in your essay something like, even, even when that happened, we never talk about being black in this program. We never talk about blackness. Um, and I was thinking, yeah, what, what do you think that uh, are the conditions ne that are necessary to, to, to generate those conversations? And it's, it's very, yeah, it was very curious and interesting to see, or these conditions that will allow these conversations to happen. Um, I think in general that the graphic design program um, tends to be very isolated in general from the rest of the school, um, largely. Uh, and in the program, uh, it's very intense. And I think that for the most part, I know for me personally, it had a lot to do with sort of just kind of being focused on what I was doing. And honestly, I, I think at the time, I felt that perhaps I was the only one that was feeling this way. And so it didn't really seem like um, uh, there was a need to go talk to anybody because maybe I'm just the only one that's feeling that way. Maybe everybody else is fine, you know? Um, but I do think that when I think about how this actual um, uh, intervention started, started, it had to do with a lot that was going on. So maybe perhaps if there was something some conversation that was already going on in the school um, that would have perhaps created some space. Maybe if that was um, a uh, black design club or something like that at the school, um, that perhaps would have created the space. But I think just the program is like really intense. And uh, it just did seem like that was, I didn't even think about it, you know? So I guess if something would have actually happened, like. Um, I'm not saying I didn't never had like any type of like racial related incidents, but I think if there was something else kind of going on, then that would have perhaps created a condition or a space to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Salas? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a lot of thoughts as well. I, I echo what you're saying about the intensity of the program and sort of the like almost tunnel vision that mm -hmm. the the rigor requires. And it's interesting because Tashika, you were one of the reasons I ended up coming to CalArts. Like we connected during the visit day when I was there. And like in my essay, I talk about, um, I was living on the East Coast at the time and like had a crazy early flight. I remember actually falling asleep like mm -hmm. behind your desk. Behind my desk, yes. <laughs> and then we ended up actually, once I came to the program sitting next to each other. And there was something about the way that you and just a Jessica Delena, I had like a moment with the two of you, the way that you were talking about your work that had this sense of uh, specificity about your experience, your identity, your mode of working as a designer. Um, and that was sort of coupled at the same time, like recently I had interviewed at another school <laughs> on the East Coast and the essay also talks about, like I was stopped and frisked in, in New Haven by police, you know, during a visit because I was seen as a suspicious person. And so I think when Michael and you and I reconnected virtually through the events that CalArts was hosting, like all these memories of that sort of inaccessibility, 
feeling of one program and accessibility of CalArts, but then also this loss where we were right next to each other, but never really talked about being black designers and what that meant, especially the few of us that were there. And, and we had other black designers in other programs by that time, both in the BFA and MFA program. And I think part of this also was like, why the two of us to do this? There was a kind of like hesitance and sort of question mark about sort of tokenism, but at the same time, felt like there was an opportunity to speak about our experience as a way to connect to community. And like the ideas for the intervention, we wrote things individually and, and installed them physically in the space, but the, our response was always collective. The idea that Okay, so hopefully that gives some sort of context of um, some of the process that we went through to sort of collaborate on um, the installation and the programming. Um, I, okay, let me back up a little bit. So this, this, this project, this series of posters um, is called Black Lives Matter too. And it's a series of, it's a project that I did um, um, a few years ago when I was asked to have an exhibition at the University of Minnesota, um, I mean, the University of Missouri at St. Louis. And um, at the time I had no idea on what I wanted my project to be about, but, um, you know, there was a series of unarmed Black people being murdered in the U.S. And um, one, um, particularly Alton Sterling, had um, died. And that was, at the time I was in New Orleans and, and that incident happened in Baton Rouge. And so then like the next day, um, Fidel Castell uh, was murdered. And so I felt like, okay, Tashika, you have to like do something. There is no way you could. In my doing something, I want to be clear that it's not that I think like designing posters is like, doing something per se, but it did something for me. It woke up the activist in me. It woke up the voice in me to try to figure out like, how do I channel this anger? How do I channel this frustration that I'm feeling? And in a way that like, you know, I don't know how many people is gonna be at this exhibition, but like at least to sort of get it out to the world into the space to where it can be received and also sort of address, address it from, multiple sort of perspectives to really get to see like how not only black people but like queer people and other people of color sort of feel when you know um things happen to us and for no other reason than how we look right or you know who we worship or who we decide to love right so um I wanted this series of posters, I wanted the exhibition to sort of be like more like a narrative and to sort of like tell a story. So for me, these first, you know, this first slides sort of represents sort of how the exhibition, how I had designed it to be organized as far as like, if you sort of thought about like you opening up a book and you're telling a story and like, what's the narrative? What's the first thing you see? So for me, it started with these two posters because I feel like this, this, um, uh, it's not a triptych, it's a, a whatever, a pair, whatever you call it, two posters in the series. But this is how they still see us was where I started because I feel like, you know, the Mammy, the Brute, the Mandingo, the Coon, the Piccanini, the Sapphire, the Jezebel, the Sambo. I feel like these caricatures that were sort of created and invented by, you know, white European men to do, you know, menstrual shows to imitate and act how Black people supposedly acted um, was how people see us now. This is the problem today because people are still seeing us through these lens, through these stereotypes, through these caricatures, not as real people, not as human beings. And so even the designer of the poster decided to do it analog because I wanted to address the fact that like, these are really old, still antiquated ideas that still has transferred over to today. So the second poster was thinking about using more digital tools to sort of address contemporary thoughts about black people being violent and irresponsible 
of lazy and and fat and obese and uneducated and being you know uh and teen pregnancy and like all these things you know that sort of associated with being black in a black community so for me these two posters was like the book cover is the thing to sort of start the conversation to sort of get at how like well what is it is when police or somebody encounter an on, on black person why did it automatically feel threatened and so you know the poem by Nikki Giovanni you know saying I don't think I'm allowed to kill something because I'm frightened it's like all these things sort of tell the story and you know we know the process like you know so I I collected some um quotes and things from you know people on social media that I felt like sort of really address you know, what it means to say Black Lives Matter and what it means to say no blue lives matter. Um, but the design of these posters were, I sort of thought about them as like tombstones, you know, for the victims. And I didn't want to do anything that, that dealt with like what they actually look like because I felt like a lot of creative people were already doing that at the time. And because I'm a lover of topography and words and a lot of forms, I really wanted to sort of speak through the topography. So just Eric Garner poster was the first one that I did. And it was like this crazy process of, you know, using analog and digital, you know, sort of twos, but sort of mimicking like, you know, traditional like newspapers. But obviously I didn't want the design and the layout to look, you know, wanted it to reference it and, you know, I am Eric Garner sort of represent, I am a man, you know, civil rights poster and like all of this stuff, you know, was sort of what I was thinking about when I designed this very first one, but that was very labor intensive process. So all the rest of the posters, you know, I still use like analog processes like rubber stamps and like, you know, letter sets and things like that. So the idea was, you know, each poster would have like, the name, the victim's name, like really big. And um, inside their names would be like their stories, what they really did, what they were really about. But then on the outside was like the stereotypes and excuses that people use to kill um, um, black people. Um, and so right here is kind of funny, uh, well, well not funny, but this is like a quote from Silas actually, where he basically went through and transcribed uh, the, the video from when Alton Starlin was, was murdered. And so just kind of putting that into, you know, typesetting and putting that into like postal form. And I did sort of a lot of that. So this Trayvon Martin poster, this is what the postals actually look like. These are just like digital renditions. So it was like two posters sort of put together and I physically sort of carved their names out as a stone. So I could have, you know, obviously got those printed that way, but it was really important to, 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 to do it manually, to do it analog. I started thinking about like type history and like, you know, um, carvings of, of Roman letters and things like that. So, you know, all of this stuff was sort of a part of my process. Um, and so then, you know, as the project sort of evolve over time, you know, it's like a never ending thing. You know, I love letter sets. So I just make these compositions, you know, from words and things that, you know, sort of come from, um, you know, I can't fucking breathe. And sometimes that's not just about like the policing of black people and black bodies. It feels like that as a designer, I can't breathe sometimes because of the accessibility and inequality that exists in, in this industry. So sort of just, you know, what it means and feels sometimes, you know, as a person of color, as a woman of color sometimes, um, yeah, I just kind of use like, you know, compositions or, or collages to sort of like express myself. So this is like a sort of like a continuation of the Black Lives Matter 2 um, project. So this last uh, section is just, um, just sort of an overview of writing and research that I do um, and just sort of addressing the type of um, lectures that I do. They all sort of stem around the umbrella of Black design history. Um, and I remember this first one that I organized with, with VCFA, where me, Silas, and Pierre created these micro lectures, like these mini lectures that was 10 to 15 minutes that sort of highlighted and focused on the area of Black design history that we were all sort of interested in. Like for me, it was Black women in design. Um, I often give lectures and talk about Louise E. Jefferson, who's a powerful, innovative designer, cartographer, calligrapher, illustrator, entrepreneur. She was one of the first black art directors at a publishing, you know, at a, at a major publishing house for 20 years. She wrote her own book when she took these five trips to Africa called um, 
the decorative arts of Africa. And if you don't know of her, I would suggest look her up. She is amazing. Her story is amazing. Her work is, is amazing as well, especially the um, maps that she designed. Um, and then just in general, you know, um, I off and on try to do some research about black people and type design and topography, because there's still like not a lot of information um, about that that exists. And um, I often, you know, I find myself a lot of writing projects has to do with those untold stories. So my essay, A Black Renaissance Woman, Louise E. Jefferson is in Baseline Shift. That's how untold stories of women in graphic design history. And so these are the projects, type of projects that I would like to sort of continue to um, be a part of. Document in a Nameplate is a book that's coming out, um, I think August 8th, the beginning, the beginning of, um, of August, I wrote an essay that's called Type Behind the Name. And that essay is basically, uh, well, first let me talk about like the project. So Document in a Nameplate um, is a project that celebrated nameplate jewelry. Um, there was an open call to events um, in cities like New York, Houston, and Los Angeles by the editors of the book, Isabel Flower and Marcel Rosa Salas. And um, where the attendees had their nameplates, photographs, and shared their stories about that nameplate for the book. Um, in addition, um, there were emails um, that people could send to in an online portal, which people could access worldwide to submit um, images of their nameplates as well as anecdotes. Um, and the project aims to um, foreground plur plurality and nonlinear history making um, through the storytellers of, of nameplates. So the essay that I wrote about had to do with talking about like the popular stylistic qualities of the letter forms and the history behind them. Um, that was used a lot for um, uh, the design of uh, the letter forms, just started talking about like um, the type styles. And um, Black Design in America is uh, African Americans in the African diaspora and graphic design, the online course that me, Pierre, and Silas co wrote the curriculum for. Um, we're currently writing a book that hopefully is coming out soon. Um, well, yeah, soon, <laughs> soon ish. <laughs> Not really sure when the release date is. Today, we actually submitted the, the, um, the manuscript. But one thing that I want to say um, is sort of talk a little bit about how we approach writing this book is that one, we sort of kind of thought about it, you know, we thought about oral histories a lot, right? Um, so we talk, we, we talk and we write from the first person perspective. It's like, we're not, we weren't really worried or concerned about like traditional ways to write academic, you know, textbooks. We don't consider this a textbook. We don't think about it as academic in that, in a, in a sort of traditional way. Um, it was collaboration where we wrote introductions and conclusions and, and all kinds of stuff together, our voices weaving together. We were less concerned about sort of creating this unified voice. We want our unique voices and perspectives and personal experiences even to shine through. And we, you know, definitely wrote about it. Um, and I don't know too many, you know, history books, like traditional history books that sort of speaks are, are is written from like a personal like perspective, but that's that's the way that we sort of approach um, the writing of this um, of this book. Uh, calligraphy and topography of Louise E. Jefferson is an essay that I'm currently working on um, that's being um, published by Bloomsburg on global topography and voices um, is a chapter that's basically sort of focused on like the untold stories, you know, of uh, unheard voices of um, people in design. And that is it, uh, thank you. And one thing I just wanna say that all the topography that used in um, this presentation was designed by Trey Seals of Vocal Type and Joshua Darden, former creator and member of Darden Studios. And as a designer um, on a mission to only make and create design that uses typefaces designed by women or people of color only. Thank you.